Hello and welcome. In my last video I covered how you can increase your dating pool to give yourself more options or better options. This time I'm going to delve into dating more specifically and cover topics such as ghosting, the chase, the spark and what to look for when you're on a date. Just a quick FYI, I'm going to be assuming that you're looking for a long-term romantic partner as opposed to something short-term like a hookup as the content here is really delving into that side of things. So let's get into the video. So I want to start with the topic of neediness and this is an important thing because it's the first lens through which you see your partner and through which your date sees you. So by acting needy or giving off the signs that you see them above you, inherently they see you below them. So by creating this dynamic where you're essentially telling them that you see them above you, instantly it's going to make them feel reluctant to proceed with the date because ultimately we want to get good value for our assets. And those assets, again, is what I mentioned in the last video in terms of mate value, but also our qualities in terms of personality and so on. If we feel like we're at a certain level, you know, we've all heard phrases such as you're too good for them or they're too good for me or whatever it may be. Again, this goes back to that whole idea that we roughly know where we stand in the kind of pecking order, at least initially. So by portraying that this person is above you, and giving those signs continually over and over again. And this could be through things such as constant texting or offering to do everything for them, such as carrying their stuff. There's a big difference between being courteous and being gentlemanly versus being kind of over the top and you know showing that you lack self-esteem. I think this is an important distinction. Ultimately, if you treat your date or partner like a celebrity, they will treat you like a fan. It's just the natural way things work. Now, I'm not advocating things such as don't reply to your date or, you know, be contrived in how you respond to them or so on. It's very important that you end up being yourself because ultimately, if you end up putting on an act or a facade, that will eventually get found out because it's not sustainable. If you end up being someone else over a long period of time, Eventually your personality will seep through the cracks and it will destabilize the persona that you've created for yourself. And often that can lead to things such as, you know, your date or partner being put off because they're like, that's not what I signed up for. So even if you being yourself puts off your partner, it's worth it because you're filtering out people who aren't compatible with you purely on the basis that you're being authentic. So if you're authentic all of the time, then eventually the person who is attracted to you will be attracted to you for who you are. So neediness doesn't really serve any purpose. So it's about getting that balance between being authentic, but also showing that you are a worthy date or partner. And that leads into the whole idea of the chase. And the chase is that whole feeling or sensation that you get from you know, pursuing a partner, but often it's because you feel that that partner has something that you don't, or has qualities that would complement yours, but also it could be a sign of self-esteem in that you see your partner as someone who will complete you. And this is usually a red flag because trying to fill your own life with someone to complete you is either a sign of low self-esteem or emotional instability. So the best advice I've got when it comes to the chase is don't chase individuals, don't chase the person, chase your ambitions, chase your dreams, and you'll find that the right kinds of people will see what you're aspiring towards, will see what path you're on, and they will step in your way, and they will end up almost chasing you. So it's been shown to be a much better strategy to improve yourself, work on yourself, improve your own self-esteem, sort out your own issues, and you'll find that the right kinds of people will come your way. The only reason people chase is because they want to get good value. They feel like they're getting a great deal in the person that they're pursuing, but that person might not feel the same way. And by molding yourself in such a way that you create a false identity will only get found out later on. So definitely don't do it. One of the unfortunate side effects of chasing or committing too hard to the chase is ghosting. Now, I think most of us have been ghosted at least once in some form since you've started dating. So, so ghosting is an unfortunate side effect of a couple of things. One being the sheer number of options people have available these days. So if you live in a big city, there's a good chance that you will be ghosted at some point purely on the basis that, you know, if there's, you know, dozens of options that this person has to choose from, then 
if they're kind of having doubts about someone, they're much more likely to kind of brush them aside and focus on someone else. So that's one thing. But I also think it's a side effect of someone's inability to have deep, difficult conversations. Difficult conversations are an unavoidable aspect of life. But unfortunately, we've kind of been brought up in a world where people don't want to have them. They think it's easier to brush it aside and forget about it, you know, sweep it under the carpet. But in reality, you know, like most things, if you don't deal with it, it tends to linger. And then you end up having to kind of deal with these things later on to, in some form or another, or it creates awkwardness. And it's much easier and better, even though it might not seem like it at the time, to deal with the issue now. If you don't think it's going somewhere with someone, then it's much better to be honest and get it over with, as opposed to let it linger and then get that message several days, weeks, months later from someone asking if they're still interested and then it keeps going and then you feel guilty because you haven't dealt with it. So it's much better to, if you're on the kind of side of you are not interested in someone, it's better to you know be honest with that person. And if you're on the other side where you've been ghosted, then don't take it personally. What I find is ghosting is not a reflection of your self-worth. It's actually a reflection of their priorities. So if you get ghosted, it really means that they don't prioritize you in other aspects. So either they're prioritizing other dates or they're prioritizing other aspects of their life and they're not prioritizing dating in its kind of entirety. So this is one of the most fundamental things when it comes to dating, and that is do not trust the spark. I know the spark feels great. It's that thing that you get, whether it's butterflies or, you know, you just met someone and instantly you feel the chemistry or people will say like, oh, we've got chemistry or whatever it may be. But I know it feels great and it's exciting and it's exhilarating, but in reality, it's a feeling. And when you kind of delegate your entire dating perspective to a feeling. Feelings are temporary, as everyone knows. You know, sometimes you feel great, sometimes you feel bad. So if you delegate your dating perspective and opinions to a feeling, it's probably going to shift, it's going to change. And it's shown that the whole spark chemistry thing is actually a very poor indicator of long-term relationship success. So the spark is essentially just a neurological and hormonal response and it's usually there when someone possesses traits that seem desirable to you. This, these traits could be kind of mystery, intrigue, adventurousness. You know, often you get it with, you know, girls finding the spark with someone with, with a little bit of edge to them. So it could be, you know, the stereotypical bad boy or someone who is, you know, disagreeable or edgy or whatever it may be. This usually adds an element of spice and that spice kind of contributes to the feeling of the spark. But you can get that spark across loads of different dynamics, it's just that it tends to be a very unreliable way of telling if that person is right for you or not. So it's shown that these chemicals and one of the chemicals that you can often get with someone on a romantic level is oxytocin and oxytocin you know makes you feel good and relaxed but it also clouds your judgment to some extent and it certainly reduces your fear response. So in the case where you meet someone who isn't a good person, for example, I'm taking like a, an extreme example, but if the person is a bad person or say a criminal or whatever it may be, and you feel the spark with them, which is often the case, and the, the oxytocin tends to lower your fear response. So you don't get intimidated by them and you're willing to kind of overlook or not even see, you might be blinded by the spark and you end up seeing this person with like a halo effect but in reality you know it's masking over their true personality or who they are it's very important that you don't ignore the red flags because in i'd say 80 or 90 percent of cases when someone gets into a relationship with someone who turns out to be not good for them whether it's they don't treat them right or they end up being not a great person usually the red flags are there from the very start. It's just you choose to either intentionally ignore them because you're so excited by this person or you try to justify why those good traits that they have kind of counterbalance or offset their negative traits. But usually when it gets to the point when the relationship breaks down, the same red flags that you noticed but chose to ignore from the very start are some of the main and primary reasons why 
things didn't go the way you'd hoped. So those red flags, it's normally a good indicator. If you feel red flags with someone from the very get go, then you know be aware of them, really kind of come to terms with them. Are you willing to deal with this? If the spark wasn't there, would you tolerate these uh, red flags? Because like I said, they are often the reasons why a relationship breaks down, even though you know you were willing to, to ignore them at the time. So if these are some of the things to be aware of and try to avoid, then what are the things that you should look for in a partner or date? So the answer is you need to discover their true profile. And the true profile, I guess, the way I look at it is made up of their head or mind, their heart and their body. So these three things combined forms their true profile. And their head is, you know, what are they like on a intellectual level? What are their ambitions? What do they hope to do? Their heart kind of corresponds to, you know, their warm, empathetic side. Are they caring? Are they trustworthy, etc.? And then their body is their physical side. Are you physically attracted to them? Because if any of these areas are missing, then either it's not gonna go anywhere or it's gonna go somewhere, but later on will come back to bite you. So it's important that you kind of assess, and I'll list here some of the areas or questions that you can ask yourself in each of those headings to help you kind of come to terms with their true profile and hopefully have a better idea whether that person is the right kind of person to continue dating. So if I had to try to compress and condense, you know, what to look for in a person in terms of what's most likely to lead to relationship success. And again, this is not just my own views. Some of it is, but it's also based on research, psychology, books I've read and so on. And the one thing that you need in order to make a relationship work long term, at least if you want it to be healthy and happy and successful, are shared values. So it turns out things like shared interests, you being, you know, completely the same type of person, have the same mentality, the same personality, these things don't matter. There's so many people who are completely different people, but it works because ultimately the fundamental shared values are the same. So having your core values that match is one of the best indicators. And these core values could be religion, could be family, health, ambition, nature, whatever it may be, you've all got a set of core values. And if as long as those core values overlap with or are identical to your partners, then you're much more likely to succeed in a relationship. But if you're fundamentally different people on a value level, so if one person, you know, religion is like their number one value and the other person, they have no time for religion, then you may feel the spark with someone but this is the type of thing that will cause a clash that's kind of irreversible in the future because you can fool yourself into thinking that these traits won't matter because you're drawn to the person. But once like the, the honeymoon phase wears off, which is shown to be around or up to two years, then the core traits, the core values really come into play and it will really test the kind of foundations of your relationship. What I found personally is if you decide to pursue someone for superficial reasons, you tend to get a superficial relationship. And over time, superficial relationships crack and break because they don't have the foundation or the strength or the density and weight to them that other relationships might. But if you build your relationship on core values, it's, it can withstand storms, it can withstand difficult moments, you know, arguments, intensity, difficult situations, whatever it may be, it has the strength to be able to deal with that. So if I had to sum up this video in one phrase, it would be, be aware of your own values and try to discover your partner's core values and that will be a good indicator if the date is right for you. That's all for this video. I hope you enjoy and I'll see you in the next one.